Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Welcome all, all the guests here today. And as Mr. Helge noted, after services, we do have a gathering afterwards with uh, beverage and food and fellowship, and it's a most enjoyable time, and you all are very much welcome. I want to thank the special music. Uh, I'm always impressed on how Dr. Hoover can get them all to harmonize and sing together, and I want to thank you for that. Also, uh, I want to thank Mr. Helge for leaving me time today. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Helge, my, my brochure is not black and white, it's colored. So uh, it must be because Vicki likes accountants more than lawyers. <laughs> or accountants are more generous than lawyers. <laughs> so, uh, but one thing about Katarina's Club, if you don't know the history, it's an amazing, amazing program. And I'm thrilled that we have the opportunity to support such a program through such a fun evening. So I want to thank all those who are putting that together. And I want to thank all those who uh, allow me to uh, divert from a diet I'm supposed to be on for at least one night out of the year. So thank you very much. I, I want to go on. Uh, the last time I spoke, I talked about the biblical perspective of debt. And this, is, this today will be the second part of that sermon that I gave in November when I discussed that topic. The message first explored, and I'm just going to review it for, for those who were not there, and, and it's been a while, so for those who were there as well, but the message at first explored the prevalence of debt in our society. And as we know, debt is everywhere. And in the message, we went through individual debt, national debt, international debt. And there is a reliance of debt on debt within the economic system we find ourselves in. For example, as of 7 o'clock this morning Pacific time, the national debt was 19 trillion, 953 billion, 582 million, and growing by the second. And in part one of the message, we explored three aspects of debt as it relates to the Bible. First, the Bible does not prohibit debt. However, there is an obligation to repay the lender. It's a payment to, and also we have to remember that interest on debt is a payment to someone for the use of their money. Nothing more. We don't receive anything from interest. It is payment for use of someone else's money. We next explored the danger of debt, and we discussed that the danger of debt is so, so dangerous in that it can overcome us, can't it? With the pressure of paying bills, of trying to meet payments, and it takes a toll on us emotionally, physically, even at times spiritually. And the funds we use to pay interest can take away from our ability to provide for our families, for providing an inheritance to our children or our grandchildren. Two quotes we reviewed during that message were as follows. Some sell their liberty to gratify their luxury, and he who borrows sells his freedom. Even the Bible points that out in Proverbs 22, verse 7, where it says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And effectively, what debt does, it robs us of our freedom. We can become slaves to the lenders, slaves to our bills. Finally, we examined three underlying factors leading to unmanageable debt. The first factor was the lack of being content. A second underlying factor of not being able to manage debt is to not be able to discern needs from wants. Many times we confuse our wants as needs. And a third underlying factor of not being able to manage debt is being fiscally immature. And there was an article I read and we're discussed consumerate or economized people. And the, the, the crux of the article was, will we manage our future or will our future manage us? Do we manage our desires or do our desires manage us? So for the second part of this sermon, I would like to go over some principles 
in the Bible regarding the management of debt. Principles regarding the management of debt. Number one, if we do borrow, we must do so with the intention to pay back all of the debt. If we do borrow, if we do go into debt, we must go into the agreement with the full intention of paying back all the debt. Psalms 37 verse 21. Psalms 37 verse 21. Psalms 37, verse 21. It states, The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. We are responsible to repay any debt we owe. And this is even in the case where circumstances are beyond our control. So, when we go into debt, when we purchase something with debt, we should do so with the full understanding that ultimately we are responsible to repay it. But that's not an, we don't think about that, do we? We get the new car, we sign the auto loan. We're not thinking, I'm responsible for paying this debt. We're thinking, boy, I just can't wait to get into the car and have that new car smell permeate my lungs. But we have to think about that. How are we going to pay back that debt? We need to count the costs. We should not buy out of emotion. And we should go into situations where we're planning to go into debt and consider the responsibility of how we are going to pay for it. Turn to Proverbs 31.16. Proverbs 31.16. Proverbs 31, verse 16. And it talks about the Proverbs 31 woman, that's obvious, Proverbs 31, and it says that she considers a field and buys it from her profits, she plants a vineyard. Now, the Benson commentary notes that for the first part of this proverb that when she considers a field, it notes that she analyzes it, whether it be fit for use and of a reasonable price, and how she may purchase it. Strong's exhaustive concordance note the Hebrew word for consider is to plan. In other words, we should plan our purchases. Benson notes again that the Proverbs 31 woman considered how she may purchase it. She thought about what it would take to purchase the field. And especially as we consider debt, we should work through and how we're going to repay the debt. What are we willing to give up in order to obtain the item we want to use with debt? We also need to be very cautious about guaranteeing a loan for someone else. Proverbs 17, verse 18. Proverbs 17, verse 18. It states in Proverbs 17, verse 18, a man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge and becomes a surety for his friend. Now, the New Living Translation renders this scripture as follows. It is poor judgment to guarantee another person's debt or to put up security for a friend. And again, we see this principle again in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 22, verse 26. Proverbs 22, verse 26. Again, this principle is talked about. Proverbs 22, verse 26. And I'll read from the New Living Translation. Don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or to put up security for someone else. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. The advice infers that the world's poorest credit risk is the person who agrees to pay for another person's debt. In modern day language, this is called co-signing a loan. When a person co-signs a loan, and when we co-sign a loan, he or she is really the one who is borrowing the money. You gotta think, we have to think about it in that way. We're borrowing the money. 
The reason a person needs a cosigner is because the lender is unwilling to lend the money to that person requesting the loan. So you need somebody with the credit to sign off on it. Now, I realize there are times that there's not much that can be done with regard to this. Many times college students need loans for college that parents co-sign. If we do do that, if we do co-sign, we need to make sure that we have counted the cost. What will we do if our son or our daughter is not able to pay back the loan? And we have to think of it that way because the cost of a college education could be dramatic. I work for a university. I understand that. That's why many students attend a community college for two years and then finish their junior, senior year at our university. When they graduate with the diploma, it says the name of the university. It doesn't even mention that there was maybe a community college that led up to re receiving that diploma. And when you do that, you're actually obtaining an education at half the cost. And it's something to consider as we manage debt and are managing our debt load, especially as we see the rise in student debt going on in our society. A second principle in managing debt, as much as is possible, avoid long-term debt. As much as is possible, avoid long-term debt. Now, in the previous message, we talked about the debt of the Israelites, and, and it noted in Deuteronomy, and if you turn there, Deuteronomy 15, verse 1, the longest the debt could be taken on by an Israelite between each other was seven years. During the year of remission, the seventh year, the Israelites were instructed to release their brothers from any indebtedness. Deuteronomy 15, verse 1. And it states, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require of it of his neighbor or his brother because it's called the Lord's release. Now, as a side note, in the next verse, the only debts that could exceed seven years were those made to non-Israelites or from non-Israelites to an Israelite. But within the family, within the community of Israelites, when you lent to a brother, the limitation was seven years and it had to be released. Now we understand in this day and age, there is some debt that requires a long-term perspective. That's the reality. For example, buying a home, many people go into buying a home for 30 years. You take out a 30-year loan because that's what we're able to afford. However, we should try as much as possible to reduce that time, maybe going 15 years or 20 years to reduce the amount of time you're making payments and effectively reducing the amount of interest you're paying on that loan. The principle that Deuteronomy 15 brings to us that God did not want his people to carry on the burden of debt throughout their lives. He only wanted it for the most for seven years, seven year maximum, because debt takes a toll. Debt is a burden. There was a reprieve after seven years. So in principle, we shouldn't be churning over our debt. For example, racking up a credit card and then transferring it to another card and then refinancing a home and and using that money to pay off credit cards only to rack up some more debt on a credit card. And, and it is my opinion that it's generally unwise to refinance a home to pay off credit card debt. Now they'll say it's a lower interest and you're paying off a higher interest credit card. Because you're using money and you're taking out a loan, remember it's a loan, and effectively you're stretching out up to 30 years paying for that credit card debt. Is a credit card charge for a dinner 30 years ago really worth it when you consider you're adding it on to a refinanced home? And I think people have hurt themselves in the long run by refinancing their respective homes when the market was booming to pay off debt only to incur more debt. They paid off credit cards because now what are they doing? They're paying off loans 
for old credit card charges, sometimes 15, 20 years ago, and that's now part of their responsibility. Sure, there's a nominal tax advantage, and sure, you save a little money on interest in the short run, but they carry the burden of that decision, of that purchase, for many years, many years after it was done. A third financial principle in managing debt, establish a rainy day fund. The idea of setting up a rainy day fund is a fund for financial mer emergencies is nothing new. You probably have heard about it. And we can see this principle of setting aside funds for emergency even in the Bible. Turn to Proverbs 21, verse 20. Proverbs 21, verse 20. It states in Proverbs 21, verse 20, there's a desirable treasure and the oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man squanders it. The New Living Translation translates this scripture more succinctly in my mind. It's follows, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Proverbs 22, verse 3. Proverbs 22, verse 3, states the prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Again, the New Living Translation renders this scripture as follows. A prudent man foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. The idea of preparing for the future here. I would like to read from a June 23rd, 2015 article from CNBC entitled, How Much Should You Actually Save for Emergencies by Kelly Grant. How much money to set aside for emergency savings is more of a moving target than many consumers realize. Almost a third of Americans are still on square one with 29% telling Bankrate.com they have no emergency savings. That's up from 26% last year at the highest rate in five years of inquiries. Failing to save is a big misstep, even when there are competing financial goals like saving for retirement or paying down credit card debt. There are always these things that pop up that normally don't happen but affect your finances, said certified financial planner Clark Randall, founder of the Financial Enlightenment in Dallas. If you're always handling those with credit, then you're never really ever being, going to be able to achieve what you want to do. Only 22% of the 1,000 adults surveyed by Bankrate.com said they had enough to cover expenses for six months, a five-year low. Another 15% said they had savings equivalent to three to five months, and 21% said they covered less than three months. The article goes on, but not all consumers with less than six months worth of expenses saved are in the red zone. Even some of those that six month savers may not have enough. That three to six month rule is just a guide, said certified financial planner Janet Stanzek, chair of the Financial Planning Association's board of directors. The ideal emergency savings goal might be as little as three months, or as much as two years of expenses, financial advisors say. say. It all depends on your personal situation. And the article then goes on indicating that the amount to set aside should be determined by factors such as your own personal job skill marketability, job security, other assets we have, etc. In other words, what we put into an emergency fund is a matter of one's own judgment. But an interesting way of looking at what we should be putting away in an emergency fund is to consider the emergency fund in a different phrase. Call it the uncertainty fund, because there is uncertainty in all of our lives. And if we have a lot of uncertainty in our lives, the more we should put away for a rainy day. The fourth financial principle in managing debt Maintain a budget. Maintain a budget. The fourth financial principle in managing debt, maintain a budget. Proverbs 27, verse 23. Proverbs 27, verse 23. 
It states in Proverbs 27, verse 23, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. We do not have flocks, many of us, but we do have finances. Do we know the state of our finances? I would like to read from the New Living Translation from verse 23 through the end of the chapter. And as I read these scriptures, I would like us to think how they would apply in our lives today. Verse 23, know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. For riches don't last forever and the crown might not be passed to the next generation. After the hay is harvested and the new crop appears and the mountain grasses are gathered in, your sheep will provide wool for clothing and your goats will provide a price for a field. And you will have enough goat's milk for yourself, your family, and your servants. As the scriptures we read just show, we are to know the state of our flocks, of our finances. For riches or wealth do not last forever. Verse 24 shows that by not knowing the state of our flocks, we may not be able to pass things on to the next generation and inheritance to them. And verse 27 shows that by prudent planning, we will have enough for ourselves and those of our family who rely on us. We cannot know the state of our flocks in a vacuum. We cannot know the state of our finances if we don't reconcile checkbooks. We don't understand how we're using our money we can only know the state of our flocks, the state of our finances, by keeping a budget. And a budget is a simple way of planning our financial life. And there's basically five steps. First step is to know your net income. We should know our net income. We need to identify all the money we get in, net of taxes and retirement savings, and how much do we have to spend during that month. Secondly, we track expenses. For one month, track all of our expenses, cash, credit, card, checks. And when we have completed this process, take the information, first of all, sort them by fixed expenses. There are certain expenses that we pay for every month that are fixed. For example, home mortgages and other commitments we have made, and those are fixed expenses. And then we break out the others as variable expenses, things that we spend on and off depending on how our life is going at the time, such as groceries and gas and entertainment. Also in listing out these expenses, indicate whether the expense is a need or a want. Third, set goals. What are some of the short-term or long-term goals you're, we are trying to, to achieve? Maybe our short-term goal is to pay off a credit card or establish an emergency fund or saving money to buy a home. Maybe the long-term goal is to provide a college fund for your children. And then fourth, we need to make a plan. This is where we determine needs from wants are important. To meet our goals, we should evaluate our expenses, especially the wants. For example, eating out, buying a car that we might not be able to afford. Maybe it's the fancier clothing. Maybe we can get it less expensively. What are those things, the variable expenses, that we could reduce in order to meet our goals? Now, we shouldn't be stoic in our approach and say, well, that's it, I'm only going to, unless you are in a dire situation, you still should have some funds a month, each month for entertainment, to do something special. And at times we need a break from the grind of daily life and sometimes we just need to enjoy something in our lives in order to reju rejuvenate ourselves. And again, this does not need to be expensive. Sometimes it's simple as a walk in the park or maybe it's going out to a movie, but sometimes we should reward ourselves for the work we're doing. And then fifth, periodically, evaluate how we are doing. A budget is a tool. It will help us determine how we're meeting our goals and adjustments we need to make along the way. So again, we evaluate our net income. 
what we get in. Track, then we track our expenses. What are our fixed expenses? Mortgage, tithe, uh, utility expenses, other car payments, and then our variable expenses. Then you set goals. Fourth, you make a plan. And five, we evaluate routinely how we're doing. If we are married, guess what? We have to do this together. And even if it sounds painful, one of the more challenging things a couple has to do is to evaluate financial matters. And it can be a painful discussion, but we have to do it. We have to be able to discuss our financial goals. We have to be able to discuss what is a need versus what is a want in order to move forward together. If we're going to be a success in this area, we have to do it together. The fifth principle of managing debt is to seek counsel. Seek counsel, but I would like to add, not just any counsel. The last principle of seeking counsel when it comes to financial matters is especially important if it's significant financial decisions we are going to make. Turn to Proverbs 15, verse 22. 15, verse 22. Proverbs 15, verse 22. It states in Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 12, verse 15. Proverbs 12, verse 15. And I would like to read from the New Living Translations. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Before we consider buying a home, purchasing a car, or just borrowing a large sum of money, we should pray about it, and we should seek counsel. Those with someone who has experience in financial matters. And it doesn't necessarily mean you go to a CPA or a certified financial planner, but it could be someone you know that has managed finance as well. Maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's a friend, a parent. We should seek out those who have our best interest at heart and are willing to be honest with us. They can keep us from making a lot of mistakes. It would appear that the reason why so many persons, and maybe we're of that group as well, don't seek counsel is because we don't like to be told that a particular action we got our hearts set upon is unwise, is not the best way to do things, is unsound. We don't want to be told that our great idea or something we're excited about is a bad idea. We just want to do it and we want people to agree. We should seek out counsel for those who will be honest with us who are sound-minded, who will look out for our best interests. It goes without saying that the worst person to seek counsel from when buying a car is the car salesman <laughs> or the loan manager. Of course they want you to buy the car. That's not the person you want to talk to. And also, don't, one thing we need to be cognizant of, don't sign anything until you check the deal thoroughly first. We shouldn't feel pressured to go into any deal. The worst deal in the world is often the one where the person rushes in, signing and capitulating to a relentless storm of a salesman, chance of a one-time offer of pressure tactics. The best offer in the world can wait. So in this message, we have reviewed principles regarding managing debt. The principles we covered have been, if we do borrow, we must do so with the intention of paying back all the debt. Number two, we should avoid long-term debt. Number three, we should establish a rainy day fund. Four, we should maintain a budget. And five, we should seek counsel, but not just any counsel. Now for the remainder of this message, I would like for us to consider our part in the economic system today. We know that prophecy foretells that the economic system of this present society, modern Babylon, will fall. 
and the leaders of this earth and the merchants and the people involved in it will lament the fall. Turn to Revelation 18, verse 4. Revelation 18, verse 4. Revelation 18, verse 4. And I'd like to read, if you could follow along with the New Living Translation, but feel free to follow along. And in the first few verses of chapter 18, Revelation, of Revelation, it's discussed in the fall of Babylon. And let's go on to verse 4. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven, Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. And then on to verse 9. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city! In a single moment, God's judgment came on you. The merchants of this world will weep and mourn for her, for there's no one left to buy their goods. She brought, bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thine wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood and bronze and iron and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and bodies, that is, human slaves. The fancy things you love so much, in verse 14, are gone, they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. And the merchants who became wealthy by selling her these will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. And they will weep and cry out. In verse 16, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. She was clothed in the finest purple and scarlet linens and decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. And the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance and they will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend and they will say, where is there another city as great as this? In verse 19, and they will weep and throw dust in their heads to show their grief. And they will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transferring their great wealth upon the seas. In a single moment it is all gone. Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and people of God and apostles and the prophets. For, for at last God has judged for your sakes. We see in these set of scriptures the destruction of modern Babylon and the world's reaction to it. We see that the merchants, the ship captains, the passengers, the crew lament. But we may fail to see what is at the heart of Babylon, what drives Babylon. First, it's the merchandise of gold and silver. This long list needs little explanation, except to note they are all luxuries. They're wants, not necessarily necessities, not needs, but wants. So it's plain that the mourning here is rooted in self-interest. No one buys their merchants, merchandise anymore. This pictures mankind giving complete abandonment to the economic wealth of this world, as well as complete disregard for God who gave it. Secondly, what also drives economic Babylon is the abuse of men. The prophets of commercial Babylon have come through abusing others. They made men slaves, verse 13. Their current economic system made men slaves to the merchants and the lenders. Remember what it says in Proverbs 22, verse 7, that the borrower is the slave to the lender. And I propose that the slavery mentioned here 
is not a physical slavery and bounding, but it's that men have sold their souls and sold their lives to the economic system, a system that on its basis, with our national debt being almost 20 trillion and international debt far greater than that, on its basis is debt. Spending what one does not have, what one cannot afford, for wants, not for needs. And in Deuteronomy, God foretold what would happen to his nation if they embraced the ways of man, the ways of economic Babylon. Turn to Deuteronomy 28, verse 43. Deuteronomy 28, verse 43. Deuteronomy 28, verse 43. And the foreigners who reside among you will rise higher and higher, but you will sink lower and lower. They will lend to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head and you will be the tail. All these curses will come to you. They pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. In the previous message, I showed that our nation's securities are being purchased by foreign countries, such as Britain, China, Japan. Our nation is in the process of becoming a slave to the lender. Which leads me to this question. How much have we accepted economic Babylon? We may say, never. No, no, no. I, I read Revelation. Uh, no way. I don't accept Babylon. But how many of us makes our wants into our needs? How many of us are so far in consumer debt that we cannot see our way out? How many of us feel it's our right to have what we want, even if we can't afford it? How many of us spend recklessly without planning for the future? If we say yes to any of these questions, we need to consider what it means in the light of our calling in the light of being called out from economic Babylon, from being called out from the ways of this world, we may have embraced economic Babylon and we don't even know it. We live in a society that's bent on chasing its dreams and becoming slaves to the lender. And people have allowed themselves to become consumed with the idea of easy finance so much so that many of them and so much so that many have been misled and lives have been destroyed homes have been divided and nations have been suppressed in a national debt that is robbing their ability to take care of their citizens god teaches us not to act on emotions while satan on the other hand wants us to jump before we are ready when difficult times fall upon us, then Satan knows he'll grab a hold of anything to stay afloat. Unfortunately, this spiritual tactic has misguided people to do the irrational and even sometimes to prey upon others who are weak for selfish desires instead of doing right. Throughout the Bible, we are told to be patient and wait upon God, for he knows better than ourselves, than we know for ourselves. We are taught to plan for our future. We are told to take care of our families. But we may find ourselves in a situation where the debt we have is so onerous that we cannot seem to find a way out. The first thing we have to realize, that we have to understand that no situation with God at our side is hopeless. With a little guidance, some well-thought-out goals, and emotional support from family and friends from God's family, and the willingness to forego our wants, we can do what needs to be done and come out of dire circumstances with a new outlook, new skills, and new lease on life. It will take work. It will take sacrifice. It will not be easy. I'm not even pretending that it will be so. As I related 
to the story for those who heard the first message, I brought a lot of, a lot of debt into our marriage. In our first year of marriage, we did everything we could to pay off that debt. In fact, if memory serves me right, we used Kim's income to pay off my debt, and I'm not very proud of that. Ridding ourselves of debt in this life is not easy. So as I related also previously, when instead of going out and using the credit card and spending wildly, going out to eat a lot and buying what I wanted to do and go traveling, we periodically went out on Friday nights and went to the local deli and bought turkey and cranberry sandwiches with the change we saved up during the week. We could only go when we had enough change in the jar. So I went from a free wheeling spender of credit cards but, it, but my wife forced me even to count the change when I went to the deli, including nickels and dimes. And I felt humiliated. But you know what? We got out of debt within the first year and began to save for our first home because we made it a goal to buy a home before we had children. And having that goal made the process of eating those turkey sandwiches once in a while as our only date night far more tolerable. It wasn't easy not saying it was. In fact, I don't remember much about our first year of marriage of events and activities that were, you know, exciting. But you know what? We slogged through it together and we were stronger for it. However, there might be situations where we have fallen into a matter where we're just over our heads. And it may be the only way out of this situation is seeking relief through bankruptcy. If one finds himself in that situation, they should consult with an attorney or a qualified professional that specializes in these matters. And one thing I do want to note, that qualified retirement assets, for example, 401k, are not subject to bankruptcy distribution. In other words, if you're in financial trouble, one of the worst things you can do is drain your retirement savings. You don't need to. They are protected. Again, consult with an attorney or qualified professional that specializes in these matters. I, know, I knew someone who went through bankruptcy, and he represented to me that the judge asked him why he drained his retirement accounts, since he didn't need to do that. Remember, even in Israel, there was a mechanism for relief. Every seven years, people were forgiven their debt. If we made mistakes, there is relief. If we're over our heads and there's no way out, if we've really dug ourselves in a hole, we have that option in this land to go through bankruptcy. There was something provided in Israel every seven years and it is provided for in this land. But as people of God, that does not mean we have a free pass to continue living life in a financially reckless manner. And going back to the person I knew who filed for bankruptcy, we discussed his situation and why he ultimately had to take that route to go for that relief. Then he asked me what I should do. Now, I didn't pre-think my answer out, I just blurted it out, and it even surprised me. And the answer I gave him was one word, and I said, repent. It shocked him, and it shocked me. But what is repentance? It's changing. And we went on how to change some of his financial habits. Living on debt can create an illusion that we're financially better off than we really are. It is a mirage, and it can deceive us. Debt can fuel the drive to achieve different levels of acquiring things in this life, but it also can drive us to a level that we cannot afford. Debt can become a burden that will rob us from focusing what is important in life because we're so distracted with the financial pressures and how to make it on a day-by-day -day basis. The pressure of paying our bills, 
of living a life we cannot afford, and it does take a toll, physically, mentally, but especially so spiritually. The accumulation of debt is not only limited to being a financial problem, it can grow into a spiritual problem, problem, one that robs us of the ability to live life as God has intended. It makes us a slave to the lender. As we read earlier in Revelation 18 about economic Babylon, there is a warning now that we should all heed. In Revelation 18, verse 4, we read earlier, but I'd like to read it again to close. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues.